Uh, thanks very much, Emma and Myra. And can you hear me clearly and see the screen? Oh, good. Good. Okay, so uh, this is one of my favourite pictures from the most recent LFAC art competition, which shows that that for a young person with diabetes or an older person with type 1 diabetes, they're walking a tightrope every day. So I, I think probably everyone on the call knows that, that the incidence of type 1 diabetes varies widely around the world. And this is the IDF ATLAS numbers, which were used as part of uh, to generate the numbers in the T1D index that Tom was just introducing. And you can see that um, Finland and Sweden, followed by some countries in the Middle East, have the highest incidence. And then this is only part one of the table. Part This is the second part of the table. And you can see that India has a relatively low incidence, but not as low as Japan or China or, or a number of other countries. And I personally think the incidence measurement in India is probably underestimated. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's quite possibly a little bit higher than that, pushing up towards the top of that the the top of that row there but uh the problem with we have with with so that, that's that's the number of new cases but when you try and translate that even if it's even if it's accurate into the number of existing cases how many cases what's the prevalence how many cases are walking around with type 1 diabetes it becomes harder because many countries don't have any data even on incidence and many studies are old and the ATLAS methodology does not allow for changes in incidence since the studies were done. And mortality is incompletely addressed. And so the mortality may be quite high in some countries and very low in other countries. And that will markedly affect the prevalence. An example of the age of the studies is, is, is shown in this global map. And you can see the countries in red have data from 2015 or onwards. And the countries in grey have no data at all. And much of the data from many countries is from the 1990s or the early 2000s. And we know also that incidence has been increasing. Type 1 diabetes incidence has been increasing. It's been increasing in around 3% a year or more in most countries that have data. And this has been going on in, in Europe and, and Australia and Canada and the United States and New Zealand for a few decades, maybe two or three decades, but it does appear to be tailing off or even ceased in some of those high income countries I just mentioned. And also this is also happening in Japan. While in some other countries, it's still increasing sometimes at 5% or more per year. And this shows this increase that I've been talking about uh, over, and, and if you log the, 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 the increase, these lines are actually relative, are very quite similar. This is data that we have from a study we did in Uzbekistan. And you can see that the top panel is incidence, the number of new cases. And you can see that that's going up by 5.6% a year over this 17 year period. That's, that's a lot. It's, it might be 3% in Europe, but it's 5.6% on Uzbekistan. And so not surprisingly, the prevalence is going up even quicker. And happily with the improved care from, from, uh, a local act, local efforts there following the St. Vincent's Declaration and, and support from Insulin for Life and Life for a Child and, and just lots of more government support there, the mortality has fallen very steeply. So these numbers change. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. And then, so that was about children and adolescents. The problem with adults when we started doing this work is that there weren't any good estimates at all of global incidence or prevalence for adults with type 1 diabetes. And we know while the peak age of onset for, for type 1 diabetes is in children, peak, peak, there's lots of adult years and type 1 diabetes can occur in, in a 20-year-old, in a 40-year-old, in a 60-year-old, even in an 80-year-old. And there's some suggestion that there's a little rise in the incidence in older, in, 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 in seniors in communities. And so you can't estimate type 1 diabetes without thinking about the adults as well. And so that led to the T1D index project, which Tom will, Tom will give you the overview of. And as he mentioned, it's a partnership between JDRF, Life for a Child, ISPAD, and the International Diabetes Federation. And that's the paper uh, published, uh, as Tom said, last, last month in, in, the, in the Lancet, Diabetes and Endocrinology. And this is the dashboard that Tom was re referring to. And this is the numbers for India. 
Uh, so, and you can dial up what the numbers w- or are estimated to be this year, last year, in, in 10 years' time or 10 years before for India and look at the different age groups. And you can see the magic number there that, that the estimate uh, for 2022 is that there's 860,000 people in India with with type 1 diabetes. That's a, that's a lot of people. And so the, the big numbers, which Tom will talk about, 8.7 million people worldwide are living with type 1 diabetes, and 1.5 and million of these are less than 20 years old. And the median age of someone with type 1 diabetes is 29 years. And this is the chart that's in the, that's in the paper, which gives numbers for all countries. And honing in on India, so this is the number of incident cases. So incidence is the number of new cases. So in 2022, this is our estimate, our best estimate of the number of, of people in India who will develop type 1 diabetes this year. And that's 78,200. And of those, almost half of them are under 20 years. But you can see there's, there's a lot of adults as well. And even some, as I mentioned, some 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 older people um, who who will who will develop type one. So seventy eight thousand new cases in India this year. That's the estimate. And then when you look at prevalence, when you look at the total number of people who are walking around today with type one diabetes, the highest in the world is the United States with one point four million, and then we have India second at eight hundred and sixty thousand. Now, we know that India has a much higher population than the United States, but the United States has a higher incidence. So that's why it comes out on top in this table. But then when you look at less than 20 years old, because of population pyramids and and more young people are in, relatively in the population in, in India rather than the United States, India has the highest number of, of young people with diabetes in the world. And this has been estimated from the IDF Atlas uh, in, in the last one, that the IDF Atlas numbers, are, I, I think, underestimate this, this number because of that increase over time that I was talking about before. And so this is the prevalent cases. How many cases are walking around today with type 1 diabetes in India? And we estimated 860,000. And even in India, that's a big number. <laughs> And of those, 282,000 were less than are, are less than 20 years old. And as I mentioned, that's higher than the IDF Atlas estimate of 229,000. And this shows the age pyramids that I was talking about. So we've got four countries here. We've got United States as an example of a high income country, Brazil as an upper middle income country, India as a lower middle income country and Democratic Republic of Congo as a low-income country. Now, the pale blue bars are the people who are still alive. And then the darker blue ones are the ones who've already passed away early. They've already died early because of their type 1 diabetes. And then you have the very dark blue ones who were people who were never diagnosed properly. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But these are these are children especially who come along to clinic and they're they've been developing diabetes, had symptoms of diabetes for a few weeks or a couple of months, and they come in and they're short of breath, they might have an infection, they might be vomiting. And people think doctors around the world <laughs> diagnose it as 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 all sorts of things, gastroenteritis or pneumonia or meningitis or malaria or typhoid, all sorts of things. And often that that misdiagnosis is corrected before it's too late, but often we believe it isn't. And so we think that a number of thousands of people in India are dead today because they were misdiagnosed when, when, when they were young. And you can see this age pyramid where America has many older people with type 1 diabetes. Now, it's very exciting to hear... Um, uh, Dr. Mohan talked yesterday about how you know he knew people in uh, in in their eighties and nineties with type one diabetes that this is happening now, and it will continue to happen. And Tom might talk more about this, but type one diabetes steals millions of healthy life years e- each year. 
So we looked at life, we, we estimated life expectancy of a 10 year old child who develops type one diabetes um, today in India. And we estimate that that's 24 years so that they will live until they're 34 years, 10 plus 24. Now they'll lose fur five further healthy life years because of diabetes complications and time spent managing their diabetes. But if they don't develop type 1 diabetes, the additional life expectancy of a 10-year-old today in India is another 63 years. I, you'd expect them to live until they're 73. So there's a huge gap between what could be and what is. And this gap is there in all countries, but it's much narrower in many countries. And so the index estimates that 39,000 people will die of type 1 diabetes this year in India. And 12,400 of those will be less than 25 years old. And 7,600 of these 12,400 will die from non-diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Now, I presented these numbers in, in Chennai, and some doctors thought that they were on the mark. I think some doctors thought they might have been a little bit underestimated, while some doctors thought they were overestimating. We're not sure, and further studies will tell, but I think whether it's 7,600 or 1,600 or 10,600, this is these are tragedies. These are children who develop type 1, which is a treatable condition, and they go along and they're misdiagnosed as something else, and, and the correct diagnosis is not made. No one thinks to do a blood glucose level, and they die. And this is a tragedy which we need to avert. And then the atlas, the index also estimates that the 900,000 Indians should be alive today, but they're not because they died early from type 1 diabetes. Either it wasn't diagnosed or they died after diagnosis. And briefly, we expect these numbers to grow. And I won't go into this in, in great detail, but you can see the South Asia panel uh, to the right of the screen here. And you can see that with increasing incidence and also increasing population and improved care, we expect the numbers of people in, in India and, and Bangladesh and, and, and South Asia to continue to grow. And looking towards the future, by 2040, we would estimate that 130,000 more Indians would be alive if they had access to a timely diagnosis. And 580,000 would be alive if they had access to intermediate or comprehensive care. Going back to the tables that are uh, the cut, like the traffic light table that Apurva showed before, that if we can move from minimal care, which is just insulin to keep them alive and hardly any blood glucose monitoring to intermediate care, which is basal bolus regimen with, with blood glucose testing and, and education, or if, or if possible to a comprehensive care, which is con uh, continuous glucose monitoring and analog insulin by pumps and that sort of thing, many, many lives can be saved. And that's the further step if you can see what technology can make. But the big step, you can see the big numbers are here in this middle category. If we can move people on to intermediate care where they're self-monitoring their blood glucose, they have the, have the understanding and they have the education to do that, the diabetes education. So what should be done in India? Now, I'm not an Indian, and, and so but these are, these are my thoughts from a distance and, and after discussion with people in, in India. I think it's important, to critical to eliminate deaths from non-diagnosis. And secondly, to ensure every Indian with type 1 diabetes has access to intermediate or comprehensive care, and finally, to map the situation and to gather more data on incidence and mortality and to monitor changes. Now, coming to non-diagnosis, I've talked about this before. There's a, there's a legion of misdiagnoses of infectious diseases and surgical conditions. I've heard of children having, young ladies having operations for ectopic pregnancy when they, when they weren't even pregnant and dying. All sorts of misdiagnoses. And the first story competition that we did for Life for a Child with uh, is this boy, Ray, 17 years old in Ghana. He wrote, as a child, I was vibrant and active. So when it all started, everyone noticed at once because I became still. I was treated for malaria, anemia, worms and others I don't even remember with both modern medicine and traditional medicine. 
I'd never taken so many treatments in my life as I did when I turned 10. After five months of no improvement, I was still growing lean and wetting my bed. That was shameful. My siblings teased me, my dad punished me, my mum thought I was just lazy. I became less and less active. One day I started vomiting and I was so weak that I could not open my eyes. I was rushed to the hospital and after a series of tests, my parents and I were told that I had diabetes. I don't think any of us doubt that, that he would have been dead within a day or two if that diagnosis hadn't have been made at that moment. And so how many are misdiagnosed? We did a, Our numbers are based on an ISPAD survey where we asked this question from 20 experts in India who answered the survey. And we talked about people under 25 years of age. And the estimate that we came up with is in, in about 2010 to 2020, around 85% of children were being diagnosed. And that's where we get this 7,600. Now, maybe maybe it's 90% or 92%. But whichever number it is, there's still a lot of deaths happening. So how do we prevent these deaths? We need education and awareness of health professionals, teachers, parents and religious leaders and others. And these sorts of programs have had success in reducing rates of diabetic ketoacidosis in high income countries. And they've also had success in reducing deaths in lower income countries. So what, what do I mean? This is an example of, this is the one that started it all, actually. This is, this is, this is originally, you have to imagine this in Italian. I don't speak Italian, but this is the English translation. But this was about drinking too much and bedwetting, a campaign in India, in Italy, which was remarkably effective. And so Australia did its own one in a typically Australian way of, of the outside, outside dunny, outside toilet, if you like, and trying to, to get that message across to young people. And to, and to older people and to their teachers and to doctors, uh, to, to everyone in the community, particularly health professionals, so that the misdiagnosis wasn't made. And then in a less resourced country, in partnership with Santa Diabet, Life for a Child shown rapid increases in observed incidence and prevalence in a period in Mali, which is a country in West Africa. And you can see that over this 10 year period, there was a huge jump in the number of diagnosed cases. And this isn't just an environmental change from in causing increase in incidence. This is more cases being diagnosed, less cases dying. And this jump between 2013 and 2014 was when we, we, we did this poster across the country. It's in, it's in Bambara and in French, the two languages that are used in Mali, and it shows someone who's drinking too much and weighing too much, losing weight, uh, the bedwetting resumption, getting too tired, <coughs> excuse me, and a very sick child, and saying, think about diabetes if, if there's any of these signs. And we have these posters in, in many different languages, but in India, it may, it may be a differently designed campaign. That's fine. We have to think about how do we get the message through to the people who need to understand this message. And so soon we'll be having, a, or JRF will be having a request for proposals. So the T T1D Index Project, we're putting out a request for proposals for initiatives that aim to reduce deaths from misdiagnoses. We're looking for adaptations and innovative interventions appropriate for the Indian context, which are measurable. The second point, and I'll go through these very quickly as I come to a close, is improving the level of care, especially in regional and rural areas. And Aperva has already spoken at length, um, uh, very, very uh, adequately on this, but there's challenges in many areas, as you might, as, as you can imagine. And so that's why we designed this chart trying to em emphasize intermediate care, which is more affordable, easier to deliver, and yet it still has has has, has quite good results. And you can see here, this is data that we published from Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, about what happens over 30 years at different HbA1c levels. And let's just look at blindness, which is the green bars, and renal failure, which is the dark bluey sort of purpley bars. Uh, dark, dark blue bars. And, you, and this is over 30 years. And you can see if you can have an A1C of 8.5%, 
you've got a very low chance of getting going blind or needing dialysis or otherwise uh, transplant or otherwise dying. Even at 9% on average, your chances are very low. It's much better to be down here at 7%. But you can you can virtually eliminate these very serious long term complications over thirty years with an A one C of eight and a half or nine percent. But if you're at twelve and a half percent, which a lot of these kids are at, then you're you've got a fifty percent chance or more of being blind or, or developing renal failure over thirty years. And actually, usually from the the data that we had, it didn't take thirty years. It took about it took about fourteen years or sixteen years. And then in the absence of re dialysis or transplant, the child would die, or the young person would die. And so there's already a lot happening in improving care, and there's many lo local initiatives, and I've listed some of the ones I know, of, some of the ones that I know about here, but there's many others. And then Life for a Child is helping, and Changing Diabetes in Children is helping. There needs to be more education of nurses and doctors. There needs to be benchmarking. What I mean by that is is looking at your clinic's A1C and thinking, how does that compare to to um, Chandigarh? Or how does it compare to Ahmedabad? How does it compare to Sydney? How does it compare to to, 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 to Stockholm? And, and thinking about, okay, well, theirs is better than mine. What can I learn? Or maybe we're doing okay, but we need to change that. That's that's what benchmarking is. It's, it, it's comparing your clinic's results to others. And then advocacy leading to government provision, and this is where I'd really like to um, uh, to congratulate Dr. Sujoy Ghosh from 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 West West Bengal, um, from Kolkata. Five districts there are getting glargine and and regular insulin and vials with syringes, one strip a day, which isn't enough, but it's a start. A1C testing, complications screening, and education, and this is happening with national and state government funding and it's, and uh, Dr. Gosh is working that in as part of the new national juvenile NCD program which he's been promoting to the government and the government are interested in taking this up and, and rolling this out in, in a larger way uh, through 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 different states. This is a very exciting approach because it's a, it's a it potentially a sustainable approach. And then finally and I think this is my last slide, we need mapping and better data. And there are expert centers in many major cities in India, but it's not clear what's happening in many other areas. And so it's most likely that Dr. Mara Said, who's, who's, who's the chair here, will be doing a project to, to, to look at this and try and map what's happening in India, not just in the, in the famous clinics that everyone's heard of, like Dr. Mohan's clinic or Dr. Sabu's clinic, but all over India, what's happening and how do we get education materials out there? How do we how do we build connections? How do we do benchmarking? These sorts of things. And also, we need more incidence data. It's quite possible that incidence varies a lot. India is a very diverse country in terms of its environment, in terms of its um, eth ethnic makeup. You know that, and and quite possibly the incidence varies a lot across India. Is it higher in urban areas? It quite possibly is for various reasons, but that's important to know. And then finally, mortality data. We have very little published information. And so Life for a Child is, is helping in, in 45 countries. We are helping 15 centers in India with, with analog insulin, analog long-acting insulin, and also blood glucose strips, three tests a day. And we're very happy to explore helping new centers next year so if you'd like support, please please contact us and we can discuss that. And our vision as a program is that no child should die of diabetes. And I'd like to, to thank you all for listening and for your attention.